Okay, so good morning everybody. My name is Julie Griffin. I work for Spectrum Health Lakeland and Caring Circle, and I do advanced care planning. Um, does everybody know what that is, first of all? Yeah, okay. Tell me, tell me a few things. What do you know about it? Sure. According to what you report to them when you pass it out, mm -hmm. if you were cremated, burial, what type of, do you know you want um, advanced? Sometimes it's if you want brought back or if you want put on machines. Mm -hmm. That's right, that's part of it, yeah. Anybody else? No? Okay. So first of all, thank you for being here because this is actually a tremendous gift that you are giving to your families. A lot of people think that advanced care planning is just something that we do when we retire or when we get older or we get you know, some kind of significant diagnosis, but this is actually something that everybody, 18 and up, needs to have in place. At the very minimum, you know, if you're driving in the winter in Michigan, you need to have emergency decision makers named and let those people know the basics, you know, and this, I'm talking about a bare minimum for like an 18 year old. What would you want if you were to be in a car accident and end up on life support? How long would you want to be on that life support? Um, this is giving peace of mind to your families. People tend to procrastinate on it um, because it can be an un uncomfortable conversation. Actually, they almost always are beautiful conversations. Um, but people think that they anticipated being uncomfortable or sad to talk about. Um, but really what you're doing is saving your family so much pain and grief and conflict when they can just be your voice in a situation like that because you've, sh you've shared your wishes. They don't have all that weight and doubt on them. Did I do the right thing? So thank you for being here. This is a really a huge thing that you're doing for your family. So again, this is for all adults, 18 and up. I wish it was 16 when people started driving, but we're not there yet. So we're working with everybody in the community, 18 and up, to get these done. It's thinking about those future healthcare decisions. If you did have a sudden you know, healthcare uh, situation or an accident or an injury, what, what would be important to you in a situation like that? Who do you trust to make those decisions for you if you cannot speak for yourself? And that is, all, that is the only time that these people come into play when you cannot speak for yourself. We call them advocates. There's a lot of terminology around it, so it can get confusing, which is why the other, you know, why another reason why so many people procrastinate, because it's got terms like power of attorney, advanced directive, living will, all of it gets kind of overwhelming. So in this instance, there's two different kinds of power of attorney. There's a financial power of attorney and that's often what you'll do when you do a will. Um, so those are the people that can write checks out of your account, talk to your insurance companies, things like that. Um, the other kind of power of attorney is, is a healthcare power of attorney, and that's what we're talking about today. And those are the people who can step in and be your voice in a situation where you can't speak for yourself. And again, it's only in those situations. So for example, if you were to be in a car accident, you're unconscious for 24 hours, your advocate will step in and make those decisions for you. Hopefully you've prepared them with what you want so that it's not so difficult for them. Um, but then you wake up 24 hours later and you're actually pretty with it and you can make your own decisions again, then it's right back on you. You're not giving up any of your decision-making power when you sign this document. It's only made for instances when you can't speak for yourself. And please uh, also jump in here at any point. I much prefer to talk with people than at them. <laughs> so please feel free to jump in with questions or, or anything <laughs> you'd like to add. Okay, so again, do those people know what you would want? Getting it written down and then making sure that it's available in case of emergency. So we're not gonna put this in a safety deposit box where it's locked away and nobody can get at it in a crisis. It needs to be on your fridge. All of your advocates need to have a copy of it. Uh, the health system definitely needs a copy of it. So if you show up in the emergency room, we know what you want and who's speaking for you. Um, and we'll go over all of that here today. So the process that we're gonna go through here is, first we're gonna reflect. Sometimes people wanna just sit down and fill out a document and rip off the band-aid, and that's fine. But what you would find is 
you know, often your ideas either um, shift as you're talking with your family about this, or it um, ends up being something uh, like, you know, you would have changed your mind about what you would want um, when you have that conversation. So you would end up doing a whole new document. So um, reflecting some, and we're gonna walk through some questions here on that worksheet uh, to talk about what would be important to you in this situation or that one. Um, and we are gonna talk about past experiences, all that kind of stuff, and that can change what you're thinking or help clarify it. Um, so we're gonna walk through the document at the end of this worksheet that you've got there. Um, so that you can make sure that you're writing your ideas down when they're finalized. Okay, so then we're gonna document it. Uh, I'll show you how to appoint a healthcare power of attorney, and then we're gonna store it. And again, just make sure that everybody who needs access to it has it quickly. Um, and then again, so this document, another reason people tend to procrastinate is because, you know, I'm 60 now. How do I know what I'm gonna want when I'm 80, you know? And, and you don't, that's the, that's the real answer. Nobody knows what's gonna happen. Um, so these documents are not set in stone. You can and should change them throughout your lifetime. And we'll talk about some good times to update it, to look at it and review it, just some good um, points in your life when you would wanna consider it. So we'll talk about that too. Okay, so choosing an advocate. Has anyone done this already? You have? Okay. Um, and does the health system have it and all of that? I called the health system and I didn't pick a place. Nobody ever had a Oh, okay. Well, I can help you out if you want to chat. But, but uh, I mean, I did with a lawyer, with an elder, okay. elder care lawyer. Yeah, yes. And that's a valid way to do it as well. People offer, people do this with a lawyer too. That's a perfectly valid way to do it. I would say. Um, just based on many, many, many documents that I see that come from lawyers, they get, tend to give all the permission in the world, this person to do this for me, this for me, this for me, but no guidance as to what you would want. So what, what we want is a document where your family can look at it and understand what, you, what your wishes are. So if you choose to get it done with a lawyer, that's perfectly fine. I would just say, please make sure that you're having that conversation with your family as well, so that they are actually prepared for what you would want, okay? So some things to consider when you're choosing an advocate. So they don't have to be family, actually. Um, our goal here, and you know, there's, this is another kind of difficult part of the, about the conversation. People don't wanna hurt each other's feelings. There are some people who think they should have, be the advocate because they're the spouse or I have to choose my oldest child, then my middle child, then my youngest child. Um, but really what we want is someone who can do the job well. It's not about who loves each other more. It's about who's gonna be best in this role, because it's a hard role. Uh, they don't have to live close. As long as they're reachable by phone, they can speak for you. So if you've got a sister who lives states away, and she really is the best person to speak for you, absolutely you can use her as long as she's reachable by phone. Um, one is important, three is best. You can have as many as you want. Um, I would say, and you know, you may, may or may not have three people. Uh, at least try to get a backup if you can because we've had the situations before where we just can't reach that first person. We had one person who was in the Caribbean on a cruise and no one could reach them. So who's gonna step in if that person can't be reached? Or the other part is very often the person that you choose as your primary advocate, because in Michigan they go in order, um, that person is somebody that you spend a lot of time with, that you're really close with. So like a husband, you know, a spouse or a close friend or a sister. Um, so what happens if you're in an accident together? Then who's gonna step in? So it's really important to have a backup if you can, or someone that we can reach until we can reach that first person again. So we talked about it not being uh, who loves you more, but who's gonna be good at this. Some qualities to look for in an advocate. Um, and please make sure to include them in this conversation. We encourage everyone to definitely include your advocates. If they're spread out you know, across the country, you can do it by phone if you like. Um, but even if they're not speaking for you, but they would be very involved in a, 
a situation, you know, that kind of situation for you, like getting informed all the time or being there, um, please include them as well and let them know what your wishes are and why. Uh, that takes a ton of pressure off of them. Okay, so first they have to be willing to accept the role. So in Michigan, they have to actually sign your document and say, I, I know that you have named me as your advocate and I accept that responsibility. Second, they need to be willing to talk with you about your goals and values. So my poor sister, I always use her as an example, but <laughs> she you know, is someone that I would normally choose because we're very close uh, and I trust her, but she cannot talk about this stuff. It's just too hard for her. She's nothing bad's ever gonna happen, stop talking about it, you know? So we can't have a productive conversation about it. And I'm just gonna choose to have mercy on her because it's not her, it's not within her comfort zone. Doesn't mean I don't love her, just means she's not a great fit as an advocate. So it needs to be someone who is willing to talk with you about your health. And, you know, so if this isn't the outcome that we're hoping for, then what do you want? What's important to you? So think about that personality trait. The most important part of this. So when you're naming your advocates, that is the legal part of the document. That's the only legal part of the document, is I trust these people to speak for me. All the rest of it is guidance for those people. Here's what I would want, here's what's important to me. They can override it. And they need that flexibility in case things go sideways and they have to adjust the plan. But that's why it's so crucial that it be someone that will follow your wishes, even if it's not something they would choose for you themselves. Um, and I would ask them that directly. Don't just assume that they can do it. Um, I always think of this woman who, uh, I was doing a presentation like this, lots of people in the room, and she was so brave, she said, my husband told me for years that he did not want to receive CPR. Absolutely not. Do not give me CPR. Well, something happened at home. You know, his heart and breathing stopped. She said, I wasn't ready to let him go yet. I just couldn't do it. And so she called the ambulance, had them do CPR on him, and everything that could go wrong, and CPR went wrong, broken ribs, took him a long time to get there, so some brain damage, and this poor woman. And now she has this memory. You know, she had to choose to take him off of life support in the end. And I thought she was so brave to share that, and that's a perfect example. Just makes me wonder, had someone asked her back before this happened, can you really do this? You know, and not that you want to be like, put somebody in a really uncomfortable spot, but you do want to ask them to really sit with that for a minute and think about, can I do it? Um, maybe it would have changed the situation, maybe it wouldn't, but that's why we include people in our conversations, just to help strengthen them and prepare them, okay? All right, and then the last quality that I would look for in an advocate is they have to be able to make decisions in difficult moments. So, they gotta be okay being uncomfortable a little bit. You know, if a doctor is coming to your family, you're on life support and they're saying, you know, or they're coming at your family with some kind of treatment decision, like we wanna implant antenna on your loved one, you know? No, that does not match your goals. We've talked about this. Absolutely, we're not doing that. So can they face up to that doctor for you in an emotionally charged, stressful situation? And think about that also on the flip side with family, because sometimes the hardest pressure comes from family. Uh, and people often think, well, that's not gonna happen to me because my family's really close, you know? But it doesn't come from a place of, of anger, it comes from a place of love, and that's even harder. They just all have very different ideas about what's the best thing to do, and they couldn't possibly be more invested in that situation because they love you. So that's why families end up you know, can end up, this, can, this kind of thing can affect them for years. So make sure that you are, um, first of all, talking with them will cut down on that for sure. If they're all on the same page beforehand, even if they don't agree with what you've said, they've heard you say it. Um, so that's why these conversations are so important. But make sure it's somebody who can stick up for you. Any questions about this part? No? 
Okay, so we're gonna start working through this worksheet. If you've got there, you can make notes on it, write questions for your doctor, because your doctor is also another person that it's good to be talking with about this kind of thing. I'll give you the basics today about CPR and life support, things like that. Um, but your doctor knows your health, so that's a really good conversation to have. What do you think an outcome would be for me if I had CPR, knowing my health and what my challenges are, okay? So what is your current understanding of your health? Talk about this with your family because there might be things, you know, symptoms or something that they aren't aware of how it affects you and how you feel about it. Everybody's very different. Different. I wouldn't just assume that they really understand what's going on. That's gonna help them understand where you're coming from in your choices. Can you see this with me, Stephen? Yeah, okay. Um, so make sure there's a spot there too to write that down for your doctor. If you're dealing with a serious medical condition, what are you hoping for with your current plan of care? And so this question is often pretty easy to answer. You know, if somebody um, has a, a really um, advanced heart condition, say, they have a really hard time breathing. Um, so maybe their goal is, I wanna get stronger so that I can walk to the kitchen and make myself a sandwich for lunch so my daughter doesn't have to drive home and do it all. You know, so these are top of mind goals. What am I hoping for? I'm sorry, I'm late. Oh, you're fine. Okay, so the next question is a little more difficult here. It is, um, if those goals don't happen. Thanks. <coughs> So if those goals and hopes don't come true, then what are you hoping for? And if you're talking with your family or do, helping someone else do this, really sit with that question for a little bit. Um, it's gonna take some silence probably. I've encountered that in most conversations because often people don't even allow themselves to consider that. You know, They don't even wanna think about an outcome that, that isn't what they're hoping for. But that's the really important stuff for your family to know. So for example, um, some of the things that we hear come out of this question are, well then I would want to be as comfortable as possible, or I would want to be at home. I would want to be alert and be able to talk with my family, you know, and have it mean something. Um, that's the kind of thing that your family would need to know because by the time you reach this point, they might be speaking for you. So make sure that they understand what would be important to you in your life at that point. Being pain-free is a big one, too. I didn't mention that. Okay, the next question is values, wishes, and living well. So what is important to you in your life? Um, some of the things that we hear come out of this are independence. You know, the, this question is on a regular good day, not a lottery-winning day, a regular good day. Who would you talk to? Who would you be around? What would you be doing? Um, that sounds like kind of a floofy question for this conversation, but what it does is give your family quality of, of life guideposts that they can bounce treatment decisions against. Because the healthcare industry, although we are trying to change it, it's a slow moving beast. Um, and what, and you, you may have experienced this yourselves if you've had um, an illness in the past, but something happens um, doctors come to you and say blah, 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 a whole bunch of medical information that's overwhelming. Wait, I don't understand, tell me more. Blah, 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 more overwhelming medical information. <laughs> when you're already stressed and emotional, you know. Um, so what we're trying to do here, not that we're not gonna pay attention to that clinical information, of course we are, but we wanna get a very basic quality of life uh, measure so if we do this treatment, are we getting closer to how mom wants to live or further away from how mom wants to live? So one example of this, I was talking with a gentleman the other day who said, the most important thing to me is having meaningful moments with my family. So I do not want to be um, snowed under with medication. You know, I don't want to be in pain, but I also don't want to be unaware of what's happening and unable to communicate. So make sure that I'm as alert as possible. So that's super helpful information for his family to know. This is what gives him a reason for living, spending time with his family. 
um, being able to interact. So now maybe he's got some kind of situation where he's going to have a lot of pain. Um, now his family knows to ask, you know, how, how much is this going to affect him, his alertness? Well, a lot. Okay, that's not getting us closer to how he wants to live. Is there anything, are there any other options we can explore? It gives them a useful tool for how to decide things for you. Does that make sense? Okay. So some of the things that come out of this, independence is important to a lot of people, spending quality time with family, um, being able to participate in activities, hobbies, interests, so anything that's important to you, there's nothing too small to let your family know. For some people, it's playing games on their phone, you know, or just being able to watch their favorite shows or being with pets, being outside is a big one. Um, so anything like that. Okay, so next question, personal, and again, feel free to jump in here anytime. So personal, cultural, and spiritual beliefs. Do you have any kind of faith-related needs? What would you want if you were nearing the end of life? Is there anyone you would want called? Is there anything in particular that you would want said or done? Um, <clears throat> anything that would be comforting to you. And if you're not a religious person, that's absolutely fine. There are still things that feed you and, you know, what, what makes your life worth living. Um, so anything that's comforting to you, there is nothing too small um, for your family to know about this. So do you have any personal, cultural, or spiritual beliefs? What are those? Are there any that um, your healthcare team would need to know? Um, some religions, for example, don't allow blood transfusions. So that's something that you would definitely need to have on your document. Anything like that. What kind of support would you want? Uh, music is another big one. I just wrote um, that down. <laughs> oh, did you? <laughs> did. Yeah, that's a big one for a lot of people. Um, and again, anything else? Fresh air is a big one for people to uh, and what brings you comfort do you like to have a tea when you're not feeling well what makes you feel a little better what do you do to comfort yourself um, so sometimes it's having a favorite movie on in the background or a favorite album or being able to lay, sit by the window and just look out the window um, anything like that is going to help your family understand it's going to help them help you at a time when they're feeling kind of helpless does that make sense like well i, I Feeling helpless, I don't know how to take care of mom. Oh, but I remember she loves that, you know, Celtic CD, I'll put that in. Anything like that. Okay, so the next one, uh, this is the treatment decision that everybody needs to consider, 18 and up. So say something has happened, like a car accident, you're on life support, so you're on a ventilator, which is the tube that goes down your throat and helps breathe for you. That's what we've been seeing all over the news for the last year and a half. Um, you know, IVs, all of it. Things are, machines are helping keep you alive. Doctors think there's very little chance, so they've run all of their tests, they've done everything they can do. They come to your family and they say, we think there's very little chance for example, less than 5%, they may or may not use a percentage, that's just for an example, that she's gonna recover the ability to know who she is or who she's with. So not able to interact meaningfully with people around her. Um, does, are there any questions about that situation? No, okay. Um, oh yes, please go ahead. I'm sorry, how would you describe death or near death Alzheimer's because that's the exact same thing. Yeah. So I would say the difference would be machines are keeping you alive. Yep. But money is very important in both of those things. It can be for people, yes. Um, that's so interesting. I just had that question the other day too. So if that's important to you, make sure that you talk about that with your family. Um, I've seen people with no means at all, not even consider the money issue. Let's just get through it and figure it out later. So it's not it's not crucial to everyone, but if it is for you, then make sure that you include that in your conversation with your family so that they can consider that when they're making those decisions. Thank you. Yeah, good, great question. Um, okay, so in that situation, would you want to stay on life support indefinitely, stay on it for a period of time, 
or have it withdrawn. And again, this is at the point when they think there's very little chance you're going to come back. There's no wrong answers. You should have what you want. Um, we just want people to consider that and let their families know because um, imagine the difference between, you know, if you had to, to decide to take someone off of life support that you love, the difference you would feel in having heard that person say, I don't want to be on this for longer than a couple weeks. I mean, that saves you decades of, did I do the right thing? What if I waited one more day? All of that <coughs> stuff. You're giving your family peace of mind. So if you choose that second option, make sure you discuss with them what period of time means to you. Because um, for some people that means 24 hours and some people that means six months. So make sure they have a good understanding. And that does not mean that if you say two weeks, they're gonna turn your machines off at two weeks and one minute. Your advocates are still gonna be making that decision based on the best information that they have at the time and talking with your healthcare team. Um, but it does give your family some peace of mind so they understand where you're coming from, okay? Keep forgetting to click <laughs> my way through. Okay, so next question. What is your understanding of CPR? And when I say that, I mean what it is and also what the success rate is. Anybody? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the whole thing. Oh, sure. So CPR, what do you know about it? And when I say that, I mean what it is and also what the success rate is. Anybody? Well, I only have one question on that point. Mm -hmm. And it's the wording of, even like the cards here, and I love this place with all my heart, but it's always the wording of everything is, would you like to be resuscitated? Mm -hmm. Well, of course I would. But then there's the prolongation of life. Mm -hmm. It's two different things. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't understand it. Do I check? No, I don't want to be resuscitated. And then write in that I have nobody to say that I don't want to be prolonged. Okay, so you're, you mean if you don't have an advocate, what do you need to write down? Correct. Okay, okay, yeah, so we'll cover that. Okay, thank you. Uh, good question. So CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation is um, chest compressions. They might use the paddles on you, you know, the shock paddles. Um, medication, maybe they need to inject you with something that'll to try to help get your harder breathing started again. Um, and then also breathing for you. So it's all of those things together. You can't pick or choose. Um, I'm fine with chest compressions. I don't want to be on a vent. Um, so you're signing up for the whole ball of wax when you sign up for it. There are no wrong answers at all. You should have exactly what feels right for you. But there's some basic information that a lot of people don't know. There's a lot of misinformation about CPR because of shows like Grey's Anatomy and ER. You know, you're going to have CPR. You're going to wake up and be friends with George Clooney. It's all going to be <laughs> magical, <laughs> you know. <laughs> George Clooney. <laughs> Um, so the actual success rates of CPR from, for everybody from babies to elderly people is about 18 to 25% of people will receive CPR and go on to leave the hospital, live for any period of time, 18 to 25%. So that depends on a lot of things. For example, where were you when you had it? Were you at home and it took them a little while to get to you? Um, were you, or were you in the hospital next to a crash cart and a team of doctors who know how to use it? You know, clear advantage there, right? Um, are you uh, older or do you have chronic illnesses? You know, for example, diabetes, kidney failure, heart disease, lung disease, um, things like that can, where your body is already a little weaker um, can affect the success rates of CPR. Um, I am not saying any of this to try to scare you. Again, you should have what you want. So uh, the thing, the main things to know about it are, 
when they're pushing on your chest, they're trying to physically move your heart, okay? So you've died, your heart or breathing has stopped. They're trying to physically move your heart, so that takes a lot of pressure through your rib cage there, so it almost always breaks ribs. There's a lot of that. Um, brain damage if you're without oxygen for, oxygen for any period of time. Um, and you almost always end up on a ventilator because it's traumatic to your body. So you are almost always in ICU on a ventilator after CPR. And that's where your life support question that we just talked about would come into play. So if you do receive CPR um, and it's not work, you know, nothing's working, they still don't think they're gonna be able to bring you back, that's when your advocates can step in and say, you know, this is enough now. Um, but those are the main things to know about it. And again, I don't say that to try to scare you. You know, if there's a little 99 year old lady who knows that it's gonna break her ribs, likely, um, but she might need to know that she tried every chance she could when she, you know, in order to leave this world with peace of mind. That's her right. Everyone should have what they want. There's no wrong answers. We just want people to know that because there's so little information out there about it. Did that answer your question? My question? Yeah. Oh, no, it's such a vast question that, yes, it did, thank you. Okay, good, good. If you have any more, just let me know. Uh, so the choices with CPR, oh, and here's a girl, here, this, okay, I forgot about this one. So this is, this is a chart, this is only for people with chronic illnesses. So the people I discussed who have, you know, advanced diabetes, heart failure, lung disease, um, so this is the success rates for people with chronic illnesses. So people who get serious, people with serious illness who get CPR and live, 15 out of 100 will leave the hospital and live for four months. People who are living in the community, so people who are living at home who also have chronic illnesses. Um, so that's five out of 100 may leave the hospital and live up to a year. And then people living in residential settings, so people who are living in facilities um, or adult foster care homes, things like that, two out of 100 people who have serious illnesses will leave the hospital and live up to a year. What's the, oh, okay, so the first one is that if you're in the hospital already? Correct. Yep, and these two are, it's, you're outside the hospital. So like if the EMT, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the, isn't a, isn't a lot of that done by you? an EMT person mm -hmm. that you call 911. Mm -hmm. Yes, so if you decide that you don't want it, um, you have to have something called a do not resuscitate order. Yeah. And those, they have to be holding that in their hands in order to not give you CPR, okay? Um, so like the, around here at least, they, they give you this thing that you're supposed to put on your refrigerator mm -hmm. and so they yeah. know where that's going to be? Correct, yes. So so this is what it looks like. And everything you need to, to do this is in that pink packet. Um, only fill this out if you don't want to receive CPR, okay? Other than that, you don't need it. Um, but so this has to be signed by two witnesses and your doctor, okay? Copies work fine. Whenever we uh, have somebody complete one of these, we give them a ton of copies just to keep in convenient places, like your purse, your glove box, things like that. Um, if you don't want to worry about having these papers, there's a little postcard in there. You can also get a medical book, medical bracelet. Um, it just has to have certain pieces of information on it for them to honor it. Okay, and so all of these documents, your advanced directive and this, if you decide that, um, will go in this pink folder on your fridge. You can tape it or use a magnet. And if you don't want it on your fridge, if you just don't want to look at it all the time, that's fine. These are obnoxious on purpose so they can find them quickly. <laughs> um, there's a removable sticker in there as well. So this won't damage your fridge. Um, it says, first responders, we have advanced directives. And then you just write down where you keep them and make it something easy, you know, like the cabinet behind you or mine says freezer because I keep mine in my freezer. Um, so you can use this instead. Any questions about, about CPR? Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. When you wear that bracelet, what does it do for your tan lines? <laughs> it would leave you a tan line for sure. <laughs>
You're always. I've never had that question before. <laughs> that was good. Uh, all right. And also in your packets. So this information sheet is in your packet. If you need it to talk it over with your family and decide what you want to do. Um, so here's all the facts about if you do attend CPR and if you do not attend CPR, what that looks like. Um, and then that graph is on the back. Okay, so the next question, help with breathing. And this is in your um, pink envelope as well. So this is for, we used to only ask people this in the last year or two of their lives. Um, but because of COVID, we've started asking everyone, 18 and up, because any of us could have to make this ventilator decision tomorrow, unfortunately. So this question is, so it's not a matter of CPR. Your heart or breathing has not stopped, but you need, you have maybe pneumonia or God forbid COVID, something where you're kind of struggling at home to breathe. Um, so you need some extra help. So how far down the treatment road do you want to go? Um, there are three options. So one is advanced interventions, and that is um, take me to the hospital. I'm fine with being in intensive care. I'm fine with being on a ventilator, which is the tube that goes down your throat and breathes for, breathes for you. Try to get me past this. If it's not working, then that's when your life support decision would come into play. Your advocates can say, you know, whatever, whatever amount of time, whatever you've decided with them, let's let's stop this. Um, but the main point is you're fine with going to the hospital and getting everything they can give at you, can throw at you to try to get through it. Okay. The next option down is limited intervention. So that is take me to the hospital. I prefer not to be in intensive care. I prefer not to have anything as invasive as a ventilator, but I'm fine with, you know, for example, a tight fitting mask. Does, that, does everybody know what a CPAP machine is? Sometimes people use it when they have sleeping issues. So it's similar to that, it's the hospital version, sort of a tight fitting mask that would, you know, do positive pressure to help you breathe. Um, so take me to the hospital, keep me out of ICU, I'm fine with, um, you know, a tight fitting mask, but I don't want anything as invasive as a ventilator. And then the last one is comfort care. So this is, I really just want to stay at home where I'm comfortable, but bring people in to help me. So these first two are curative, you know, like I'm trying to get through and pass this. Um, this last one is focused on quality of life and staying as comfortable as you can. So that might be home care or hospice coming into your home. Um, maybe you have oxygen um, to help you breathe. Maybe they give you some medication for anxiety because that can cause a lot of anxiety when you can't breathe. Um, so those are the three options. Are there any questions about that? Don't, I mean, in situations I've been involved with, people move from one to another mm -hmm. rather than just being in force. Is, is that often the case? It can be, yes. So again, this is part of, this is your um, guidance for your advocates. They're gonna be making the decisions based on what the healthcare team is telling them, but you hopefully have talked to them ahead of time and you've said, my preference is to not be in ICU. I don't wanna be on a bed, just for example. Um, so your family can be aiming towards that. Can we manage this at this level? You know. But you would be, uh, so if you're conscious, this decision is for you. You know, you're able to give them your, your choices about what you want. If you're not conscious, then your family would be making that decision. So on that ventilator, that goes back to the, <clears throat> the chart where you had about the 15 people that are in the hospital. Mm -hmm. With chronic illnesses, with oh, the chart. With yeah, yeah. Um, not everybody, just chronic illnesses. So what's the percentage of people that are that are put on a ventilator that eventually get off that ventilator and live. You know, walking in. yeah, that's a good question. We, <coughs> we used to try to keep a number when we were presenting this, but everyone is affected so differently by COVID that we didn't feel like we could, could have an accurate number um, to give people. So, um, you know, that also depends on the same things with like CPR. Do you already have chronic illnesses? How old are you? You know, um, I mean, like else. the doctors will, I mean, 
they're going to have conversation and say like, okay, the you know people your mom's age, blah blah blah, mm-hmm. chances. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're going to give you some guidance also, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So this is you telling your family <laughs> and your healthcare team, here's what my preferences are, and then you've got to trust your family to keep you as close to your goals as possible. Regardless of what the doctor says. Exactly. Yeah, and a doctor, yeah, that's why they need to be Mm -hmm. strong enough to say she doesn't want that, you know, or she does want it. Why can't we have it? Let's get her on a bed, whatever the the situation is. Oh, great, okay, thanks. (laughs) Okay, Um, any other questions about that one? So this is what we just discussed because you actually asked me the question. So um, there's not a solid number available for survival on a ventilator because it affects people so differently. Um, And again, you know, advanced age, frailty, or other health factors can decrease your chances. Um, And it it requires hospitalization. I think now they are allowing one visitor in the hospital except for COVID. So, but in the beginning of the pandemic, this was a big factor because people could not have family with them, you know? So thinking this through ahead of time, you know, how long do you want to be on a ventilator in the hospital when you can't have your loved ones with you, things like that. These things that are there, aren't they the same COVID or not COVID? Mm -hmm. These things? Yep. Okay. All right, so if you, does anyone have any questions about the things that we just talked about? No? Okay, so if you would like, I can walk you through this document um, and show you where your answers will go when you do discuss this with your family. It's in your pink folder, it looks like this. I'm sorry, once again, Mm -hmm. when you do not have Family. Mm-hmm. Is that going to be in here somewhere? Yeah. So I, I think mean, I think I you missed that part actually. And my cat. Okay. I I think you came in after we talked about advocates. So I I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. No, that's I'm totally sorry. fine. I was just reminding myself. So advocates do not have to be family. They do not have to live close. Um, as long as they're reachable by, by phone, they can speak for you. So if you have good friends or a pastor or a neighbor, anyone in your life that that you're close with or you think would be a good advocate, they can absolutely do that for you. I hate to sound like a conundrum, but you're not. I really don't have a whole lot of people that it's just not there. Well, that, well we I mean, could do that's that to come. That, yeah, that's but then it's going to be more common the older we get. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. And that does happen. So I would say, I mean, you're certainly not the only person that has been in that situation. I've met. I make, I make yeah. a lot of friends. I'm a, I'm a great neighbor. I'm yeah. your mom and the neighbor. Uh-huh. But they're not going to come in and say, oh, yeah, that's what she You don't think so? You, oh, yeah. Not anyone that you're close with? No. Okay. Well, then it's even more important, I would say, to have a document. Not to make this kind of decision. Okay. You know, I I do apologize, but... Oh, you do apologize. One of the instincts of people are to help people right away. Now, that's resuscitation. Mm -hmm. So I have a problem with the two words. Resuscitation. Anybody can be resuscitated, almost 99.9%. The prolongation of life is what I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. Who makes that decision there? Is this what you're talking about? It is. Because on the card that I filled out here, it says resuscitation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the AED on the wall Mm -hmm. can do that in a minute. It can even tell you when to do it, but after that, mm-hmm. then what? So is this yeah. what this is about? 
Yes. Oh, so first of all, 99.9 percent .9 of people cannot be resuscitated. The success rate is about yes. 18 to 25 percent, and that's everybody from babies to elderly people. But what you're talking about, so life support, once you're on life support, how long do you want to stay on that? Or even, you don't even have to be on a ventilator. There are chemicals that are off. There's so many things in medicine now. We can <laughs> So, okay, I think I understand what you're saying now. So, prolonging your life, um, there's two different areas where you're doing that. Some of what you're talking about, I think, is, you know, getting, taking medications that can help you with the disease to stay alive longer. But the life prolongation that we're talking about here is when you're on life support. So, machines are keeping you alive. Okay. And I will cover hospice. Now, for sure. now I'm yeah. Thank you. I think it took me a little while to understand that. No, yes. Thank you. Of course. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So these first two pages, um, these first two pink pages, we've covered, but you're welcome to review it later. Um, so let's get into it here. So this is the first page. You're going to fill out. So your name and the date goes up top here. If you have a preference for hospital care, you can write it in there. If you don't, you can leave it blank. In an emergency, they're going to likely take you to the closest hospital um, if it's a time issue. Uh, but you can absolutely write that in there as guidance for your love, you know, for your advocates if there's a place that you prefer to be, and if it's possible, they'll they'll make that happen. Uh, and then there's an emergency contact. This does not have to be the same person as your advocate. Um, if there's a neighbor who makes more sense, you know, while, to call while your advocate is getting there, um, you can write that name. This box here, where it says designation of patient advocate. So if you're completing this document for someone else, um, make sure you fill out this box. You can ignore it if you're filling out your own document. This is just for people, you know, sometimes we have people who have vision issues or shaky hands or something and we're filling it out for them. We just wanna know why it's not in that person's handwriting, okay? And then here's where you're gonna name your advocates. So. Primary goes first. In Michigan, they do go in order. That does not mean that these people can't work together and talk. Of course they can. But if it comes down to a disagreement, they're going to go with what this person says. Okay? Or if um, you know this person's not available, two and three are involved, they're going to go with what number two says. They're always going to go with whoever is highest on the list and present. Um, hopefully you're going to eliminate some of that by talking with your family. So. But just know that that's how it goes and think about this order okay just gonna write their names in if you don't have an advocate I would write in here under primary advocate no advocate at this time use document um, to speak for you don't you need the phone number or something yep that's in a couple pages oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're ahead of me every time you're hired <laughs> all right This is just for your patient advocate to read. In Michigan, they have to sign acceptance, remember, and say, yes, I know what I've, you named me and I'll do this. Um, so that's just for them to read over so they know what they're signing up for. There's also an information sheet in your packet. So this has advanced care planning on the front, what it is, if you wanna take it home and talk with your family or your advocates. Um, and then on the back side, there's a patient advocate guide. So you can use this when you're saying, you know, I'd like to name you as my advocate. Here's what it's about. Um, so you can, you're welcome to do that. If you move, mm -hmm. when you do this, and then say two years from now you move, mm -hmm. even within the state of Michigan, mm -hmm. you're going to want to, that's a, an, another time to update all this stuff. Mm -hmm. yep. Major life events, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yep, and so Michigan, um, <clears throat> This document will work anywhere in Michigan. And Michigan has uh, tends to have more stringent laws around it. Ours requires two witnesses. Um, so ours tends to work in most states. If you spend a lot of time though, like if you winter in Arizona or Florida, you know, it might be worth doing a, uh, a document there as well. 
and getting that into your health system just to, you know, if you spend a lot of time in another state or if you move to another state, you might as well just make sure you have it. Okay, so here is where we're going to do their contact information. And they are, so your name and date of birth goes up top here, just in case the pages ever get separated. Um, and then here's, they're going to uh, fill in their information in the same order that you named them up front. So this is your primary. They're going to fill out this box so we know how to get, get a hold of them. And they're also going to sign and say, yes, I'll do this for you. These dates don't have to match because advocates can be spread out all over the place. Um, and I also would not wait. So if you have um, a daughter who lives in the area who's going to speak for you, you can get her signature pretty easily, but you're not going to see this advocate until Christmas. There's a lot of winter driving in between there. So make sure and get this in. Um, and then once you get their signature, you can update it just to make sure that you're covered because they can also sign even as they're walking into the emergency room to help you. They can sign at any time. Okay. And also, so if you do have advocates that are spread out all over the place, um, copies work just as well as the original. So you can just make a copy of this page and mail it to two different people. They sign it, send it back, and then you just combine them into your document. Okay. Okay, this next page here is the most important one to slow down and think through because this is where you're making it legal. All right, and we see most, the most of the mistakes that we get happen right here on these dates. So this document does not have to be notarized. It does not have to be um, signed by any kind of court representative. Uh, it does have to be witnessed by two people, and they cannot be family, people who are going to benefit from your will, or anyone who works for the healthcare system that you use. And that's because they don't want it to be anyone who might be trying to sway you. Or influence your decisions. That's sweet. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so these people don't need to know anything about your document. It's not their business. All they're doing is witnessing your signature. That's their only responsibility. And that's why these dates have to match because the idea is they're standing there watching you sign it. Okay. Um, so make sure that the dates that they sign are the same day that you sign. Um, that friends, neighbors, people here at the senior center, you guys could even sign for each other if you want to do that. Yes, we do a lot of signing for people. Oh, you do, wonderful. Oh, that's, yeah, different things, but yes. Okay, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I wonder about that. Perfect, yeah, so um, that can be anybody and that's their only responsibility is watching you sign. Okay, this next page here, treatments to prolong my life. So again, what we're talking about here is you're on life support. So you're on a ventilator, machines are keeping you alive. This is the situation we talked about where you've been in an accident, for example, um, doctors have done everything they can do. They come back to your advocates and say, there's very little chance this person is gonna recover. Okay, so these anything that looks like one of these lines, you're gonna initial your choice. Um, and they go most aggressive to least aggressive. So this top one is, um, I leave me on life support indefinitely. Miracles can happen. Um, so I want all possible efforts to prolong life made on my behalf, even if it means I may remain on life-sustaining equipment, such as a breathing machine or kidney dialysis for the rest of my life. So if that's what sounds right for you, then you would initial that one. The next option is, I want my healthcare providers to try treatments to prolong my life for a period of time. However, I want to stop these treatments if they don't help or if they cause me pain and suffering. And so that's what we talked about, you know, let your family know what period of time means or your advocates, what that means to you. And then the bottom one here is at the point that they've said there's not much hope I'm going to come back, I want it withdrawn at that point. Any questions about this page? And in all of these situations, you would be kept comfortable, just so that you know you're not choosing, you know, to have no treatment. They're going to be keeping you comfortable and, and calm. On the very bottom, then we can talk about the uh, choose not to complete this section. Yeah. So, if you don't want to make a choice 
here. You don't have to fill this out. You can just initial this bottom line, but know that if they have no information, they have to assume that you want the most aggressive option, okay? They have to always err on the side of keeping you alive. Okay, next page here is CPR. So this is what we just talked about. And the options are, if my heart or breathing stops, I want CPR in all cases. There's a middle option here. I want CPR unless my healthcare provider has determined that I have any of the following. An injury or illness that cannot be cured and I'm dying. No reasonable chance of surviving if my heart or breathing stops or little chance of surviving long term if my heart or breathing stops and it would be hard and painful for me to recover from CPR. And then the bottom one is I do not want CPR but instead want to allow natural death. And that's the point where you would need a do not resuscitate order. So the things to know about this middle one, remember unless they are holding this do not resuscitate form or they see a bracelet on you, they have to give you CPR. So this is guidance for your healthcare team and for your advocates. Hey, if it looks like, you know, if you know I have a terminal illness or that it's not likely I'm gonna make it, you, you know, cause your advocates can tell them, stop. Um, but remember, so if this happens at home and you don't have one of those two things in place, a do not resuscitate order or a bracelet, you're very likely gonna receive CPR. But this can state your preference. Any questions about that? I do have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so you take it, to, take your complete forms to the doctor, to your primary care, and they scan that in. So mm -hmm. when EMT, how, what's the process? Yeah. So we get it into your chart, um, or you will at your doctor's office. Mm -hmm. I can help you with that if you want. Um, so it'll be available electronically in the emergency rooms and at any any place within Spectrum Health Lakeland. So they key your name. They see your driver's license, they put that in before they do anything? EMS cannot see it yet. Okay. I wish that they could. And I think we're heading that way where we have a state repository and people can look, but that's a way it's years off. Hmm. So again, they will look for this. So if something happens to you at home. Oh, so we have that's why you have it on the refrigerator. The pink or, folder okay. or the sticker. They'll look for that on your fridge. And if you have a DNR order in there, they will respect that. So the, the EMT is going to look for that. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna flip through this whole packet of stuff? They're gonna look for a DNR order, especially. Yeah. So that's something you might want to have on top then. Yeah, I always put them facing out, you know, so it's right on top in here. Like if this was in the envelope, oh. they can see it right there. Okay. Yep. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. It's amazing how hard you have to work to not get CPR. <laughs> we used to always joke about, um, oh, I'll get a tattoo to my chest, you know, but then that actually really happened. A couple of years ago, a guy showed up in an emergency room, it wasn't our health system, um, with DNR <laughs> tattooed on his chest, and they couldn't honor it because it didn't have any witness signatures, his doctor hadn't signed it. They're like, this could be his girlfriend's initials, sure. you know? <laughs> so they had to do CPR on him until they did locate the document, and then they, then they stopped because they found it, but yeah. Wow, Isn't what that crazy? Story. Yeah. Are you okay? <laughs> Unbelievable, isn't it? It's very scary. They make sense. A simple thing is dying. Yeah. Well, nobody's comfortable with it in this country, you know? Well, that, yeah, We're getting there. Not, nah, nah, nobody, but many. Many, right. yes. It's true. That's okay. I kept Julie. Any other questions about that? No? Okay. So this next section down, medical interventions. So again, no, this I'm is... sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Mean to interrupt you, but does EMS... Are they all aware, or is this just the state of Michigan to look on my refrigerator and see that big, big thing that said? Yeah, so this is just for our area. Different health systems have different processes. So it doesn't work everywhere? No, the documents will work everywhere in Michigan, but the system for how they find it, you know, some health systems have like a tube that people put in their freezer. 
Um, for Lake, Spectrum Health Lakeland, we have this pink folder that we use, and we work with the EMS on making that. Like, what what are you comfortable checking for while you're in a hurry? Because they don't have time to be digging no. through papers. No. But they're like, yeah, we could look on some of these fridge no. real quick. The, the, the yeah. thing the EMS does is go directly to the person. Yeah, but they will look on your fridge for the this. The trained. They helped us design this. Did they? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's neat to know. Yeah. Yep. Because they don't like, my gosh, when we were working on designing this, I talked to a guy who had been a uh, first responder for years. Yes. And he too. said, every time I drive past this one house, it just kills me, even though it's been like decades. Um, he went to this house, someone, you know, their heart of breathing had stopped. Um, they started doing C CPR on this person. And then their family came out of the bedroom. I don't know why they were in the bedroom, um, but said, stop, stop, stop. She doesn't want it. She doesn't want CPR, you know? And he, he feels horrible about that. They don't want to give people treatment that they don't want, but they have to do it if they don't have yeah, the, the information or the tools, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, it's... And so the bottom line was he looked at the refrigerator and made a decision. No, their advocates were there. They had advocate paperwork. Well, yeah, good question. Any other questions? Okay, so this bottom section here is what we talked about. So your heart or breathing hasn't stopped, but you need some extra help with breathing. How far down the treatment road do you wanna go? So again, this top one is advanced inter interventions, which is basically take me to the hospital, I'm fine with being in ICU, I'm okay with being on a ventilator, that tube that goes down my throat, give me everything you've got, and then if it's not working, then your life support decision will come into play where you've told your family, I've been on life support for a couple of weeks, I don't wanna be on longer. Um, the next one down here is limited. So I'm fine with going to the hospital, but I prefer not to be in ICU, and I don't want anything as invasive as a vent, but I'm okay with one of those you know, positive pressure masks, um, medications, things like that. And then this bottom one here is comfort measures only. So that's leave me at home where I'm comfortable, try to keep me calm and pain-free if you can. Um, supplementary oxygen is fine, medications for anxiety, things like that. Um, so those are the choices. Does anybody have any questions about that? Yes, is EMS gonna stay there and make sure you get this comfort measures only? Or who, who? Yeah, so that would be. Of that comfort measures only? Well, if you call EMS, they're gonna take you to the hospital, most well, likely. Correct, but. Yeah, but you're, this is for your advocates and for them to look at and say, okay, we, we're pretty sure she wants comfort measures. How can we get her there as quickly as possible and get her comfortable and back home? Wouldn't, wouldn't that choice be dependent on what happened to you? Exactly. That put you in this situation? That's what I keep thinking about, Pam. Exactly. I mean, you know, if you're in a car accident, Mm -hmm. And there's so many. Your I mean, yeah. I mean, okay. You could have a heart attack. If it's a heart attack, then what? If it's a car accident and your, you know, your body is not going to make it or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. so this is your heart of breathing so hasn't stopped. So it's not a matter of first responders coming and doing CPR on you and you getting life support. This is, I've become ill or injured, you know, how far down the treatment road do I want to go? Do I, do I want everything thrown at me to try to get past it? Um, or give me like, you know, give me what you've got that's not invasive, like I don't want to, to be on a ventilator, uh, or I'd like to stay where I am at home and be kept comfortable. I know you talked about CPR and the rate of success. Mm -hmm. What about the ventilators and their rate of success? Yeah, so it, that really depends on the situation. We did try to come up with a number. Oh, you said that earlier, COVID. that it was hard. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, that's okay, it's a good question. Because COVID has been found to not be a good thing to be on a ventilator. I worked with a lot of COVID and, and Excuse me. It, it, 
it turned out to be an inadequate thing. So medicine changes so much mm -hmm. all the time. It's just a magnificent change. It's, yeah. yeah, it depends on a depends on the situation. Yes. Okay, any other questions about this? Okay. Okay, this is the page about what's meaningful to you. Uh, remember, there's nothing too small to put on this page. So if I'm nearing my death, I'd like these things for support and comfort. Um, who do you want in the room? What do you want around you? Is there someone that you would want called, like a pastor? How can we reach them? Um, there's nothing too small for this page. Uh, pets, music, prayer, uh, anything that would be important to you. Uh, even if you feel ridiculous, <laughs> this is the page that your family will look at and in a situation where they're feeling helpless, it gives them something they can do for you. You know what? This mm -hmm. is one of the most perfect pages oh. in this whole thing. Good. I'm glad you like it. It is. Good. It's wonderful. Good. Yeah, and this is the kind of thing, not that getting it done with a lawyer is not valid. It absolutely <coughs> is. But this is the kind of information like, that those documents what, don't what, do. What do I, could, could you just sit and read to me? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Right then. Could you just hold my hand? Mm -hmm. could you, yeah. Could you just tell Kitten that I'm not coming home? This, this is perfect. I'm glad. You should go frame this one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got your stamp of approval. Um, yes, so nothing too small. And I'll give you an example. So we had a patient once with hospice who's, um, she was intubated. She was tired of being intubated. Um, she wanted to go home and have it removed and die a peaceful death. So she, we took her home from the hospital to her house, and she was going to be extubated at home, have the vent withdrawn. And uh, her family, all of their holidays, all of their happy moments, they always had this lasagna that she made, right? And everybody loved this lasagna. <laughs> and she had written, I love the smell of that lasagna, you know? And they, the family started the lasagna before she even got home. The whole house smelled like it. They extubated her, I know. They extubated her. Her whole family was there telling stories Here and just tears. loving on yes. her, you know? Yes. So, yeah, did she feel ridic ridiculous writing lasagna? Probably, but it made an amazing memory for that family. That's a happy memory now for them. She died peacefully at home with the smell of lasagna just how she wanted to, you know? So. Nothing's too small for this page. Little one, put little one, put a, a big, big gold star on this page. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm gonna remember you when people blow it off because a lot of people are just like, yeah. Don't hide it. I'm like, no, page seven of nine. <laughs> well, the, the emergency room doesn't like that. <laughs> They're like, we don't need this. We need to know if they want CPR. <laughs> okay, so one question on here that we have not talked about is if I'm dying, I would like to be at home in a hospital or not sure. Now, obviously none of us knows how and when we're gonna go. So this is, if I had my preference, here's where I would wanna be. Um, so there's another, a ton of misinformation out there about hospice. Has anybody in here had an experience about hosp with hospice? Okay, and what do you know about it? I like it. Oh, you had a good experience? Yes. With okay. my uncle, they made them, him feel extremely comfortable and good. he passed. Good, good. So the thing about hospice, if you're a person who really wants to stay at home, that is a great way to do it. And so many people, unfortunately, only get that for the last few days because the misinformation about hospice is that it's only for the end of life the last few days of life, you're giving up. If you get hospice, no. you're gonna die as soon as no. you sign up, you know. But hospice is actually made for six months or even longer. Yes. Yep, and that is a huge benefit to your family. It's a Medicare benefit. 
lots of insurances <coughs> cover it. So what it is is, so you've decided that you, you know, you're declining, you've decided that you want to stop treatment for, you know, like a lot of people end up choosing that when they've had chemotherapy is not working anymore. Although it's not just for con cancer patients, it's anyone can have this. It's meant for six months or even longer. It brings a doctor into your home, um, nurses. So they would sit down with you initially and say, what are you struggling with? What are your goals? How do you want to spend your time? Um, and they will customize a plan for you. Um, so brings in a doctor, brings in nurses for the frequency that you need. The big one is um, hospice aides. So they can help with personal care, like bathing. Um, that's the kind of stuff that gets really hard on caregivers, especially family caregivers. If it's you know two older people trying to take care of each other, that can get all that lifting and everything can get really hard. Um, so they will come into your home and help you do that. Um, you know, whatever the frequency is that you need. Um, social services, so they can connect you with things that would be helpful. I'm struggling with cleaning the house. Okay, well, we know an agency that can come do that for you once a week. Um, or Meals on Wheels is a big one. There's a lot of little um, organizations throughout the community that you may or may not know about, and they can help link you with them. Um, so the whole goal of that is to help you live as high a quality of life as possible with the time that you have left. So let's keep you out of pain, let's keep you stable. So you're not running to the emergency room in the middle of the night every time something happens. Yeah. Um, and that's another big one that gives your family somebody they can call 24 seven. So now when something happens in the middle of the night, they've got a nurse they can call and say, here's what's happening. And if you need to go to the hospital and want to go to the hospital, they'll send you there. But they can also take, send a nurse out to the home if it's something that your loved one can't deal with, you know, and you need it. Um, so it really cuts down on on all that back and forth, people get so exhausted as they're nearing the end of life because of all those emergency room trips or because they're going out <coughs> seeing six different specialists, you know, and it all kind of snowballs. We've probably all seen it with friends and family. Um, so just know that that's available to you for six months or even longer. You don't have to wait for your doctor to tell you when it's time. You know, we would work with your doctor, but you can call yourself and say, listen, I'm just starting to struggle at home. Um, they would send a nurse out to do an assessment, and that's a that's a free thing. It's a it's a good thing to do just so they even if you're not ready for hospice, they've got a baseline on you. Like here's where you are in this moment in time. <laughs> Maybe you're not ready for hospice, but in three months you're struggling even more. Now we know where you were. We can show that you're declining, and that you would qualify for hospice. That's wonderful. The, yeah. The yeah. other kind, the other important, another important part of hospice is the after. Yes, thank you. You're so right. Grief counseling is also yes. offered to families. Yes. The standard is 13 months, but they, you know, we have people can be with us as long as they want to be with us. But it provides your family some real support after you pass. Because that's well. one of the things I try to get people to understand, even if, because they they don't they want to wait until those last couple of days, yes. and then you know they're transform this person by ambulance and and I'm I'm a pastor so oh, yeah. it's like you know what's gonna happen you know if they have done this weeks right. or months ago but the thing that oftentimes we'll get them to go ahead and do it is to say look this is gonna be real good care for you after mom dies mm -hmm. yeah. because yeah. because yeah. of that year you're you're gonna get the help us. Right. And we so often I think it was last time I looked, it was like forty percent of people that get hospice care get it only for the last few days of life. Which is so sad. And we always hear, Oh, I wish I would have known uh -huh. about this sooner, you know. Yes. But doctors are human beings and all of their training is in fixing you. You know, that's a real that's a can be a really hard thing for a doctor to say, I can't fix you anymore. Well, that's the you know, thing. Yeah, so I wouldn't count on a doctor to tell you when it's time. Absolutely ask them. You know, that's a great conversation to have with them. Um, but you're, you can call yourself. 
Um, and the other nice thing about it is, and there's all different kinds of hospices, and you can and should interview them and see which one you think is the best fit for you. Um, so there's all different kinds. Sometimes people think it's just one big national organization, but there's many, many, many different companies. There's not-for-profits and there's for-profits. Um, all of them are different. Generally, I would say the not-for-profit hospices tend to take their dollars, you know, anything that they've earned, donations that come in, and put it right back into services. So they can tend to have something, you know, extra services. Like, um, so I work for a nonprofit. And we offer massage therapy, um, pet therapy, we honor veterans, you know, all these other and some extra grief services. So make sure that you're asking them what kind of extras they have outside of what Medicare requires. Because everybody has to have the 13 months of grief. Um, and you know, so sometimes the for-profits will stick to that because that's what they're required to do. But there's not necessarily any extra. And that's not for all of them, but you know, ask, ask the questions. Um, so the one, and another thing to ask about, so I work for a not-for-profit, and sometimes we meet people all the time we meet people who are, not quite ready for hospice, but they're still struggling. So um, there are some other non-hospice services that are also available. So you're not quite ready for hospice, but we're not gonna just leave you struggling. You know, there's a step back from hospice, which is palliative care, and that is pain and symptom management. So that's an, we would work with your doctor, that's sort of an extra level of just making sure that you're comfortable and stable, trying to keep you stable, because it's those trips constant trips to the doctors and to the hospital that just wear a person down. Um, so sometimes what happens is people get on hospice and then we call it graduating. <laughs> they actually stabilize because they're not doing all those trips to specialists and all that exhausting stuff anymore. Then they, they graduate from hospice. They don't need it anymore. But that doesn't mean they don't need any help. You know, So then they would just slide right back into palliative care. We'll help keep your symptoms managed. Um, then if you start to decline again, you can slide right back into hospice. And then there's another level before palliative care, so that is house calls. And that's for people who are struggling um, to get to the doctor. Maybe it's a transportation issue, or it's just, it takes three people and five carts to get out of the house with all the equipment that you need. Um, so that provides a primary care doctor who comes to your home. And then one extra le level before that is transitions. And that's for people who are, that's a free service. Um, they are trying to, starting to struggle with serious illness and the decisions that they might have to face. Um, so they can help with things like, you know, applying for Medicaid, I don't know what I'm doing, or uh, I just can't keep up with my house anymore. Help me find somebody who can clean my house, you know, um, and kind of guide you on that path as you're starting to have to make those decisions. Um, so the, the nice thing about that is you don't have to know where you fit. Um, but also, you're not going to get left high and dry if you don't qualify for one. You just slide back into the level of care that you need, and then if you need more, you slide right back. Um, so ask, as you're interviewing hospices, um, I would ask them what other kinds of service they have, services they have like that. Any questions? No, that was very, very, very informative. Thank you. Good. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so that's that page. And we're almost done, I promise. Organ donation. So again, if you don't want to fill this page out, you certainly don't have to. You can just initial this down here. Um, so if it's on your driver's license that you want to be an organ donor, you will automatically initial these top three lines because you're automatically added to the state registry if it's on your driver's license. Okay. And then there's other choices here, like I only want to donate the following organs, or I want my body to be donated to an institution. So if that's the case, um, for a lot of people around here, it's either U of M or Michigan State, they want to donate their body. Um, you actually have to, have to set that up with that institution ahead of time. So call the medical school, they will interview you and see if you're a good fit, and if you are, then they will send you what you need to keep with your papers. It's usually a little postcard or something that they give um, so that the medical team knows to call them right away. Um, I would. If you are a person who has, um, who really does not want to be on life support or you've chosen to immediately withdraw life support if it's not working, um, consider this if you want to be an organ donor because they may have to leave you on life support for a little bit longer in order to make that happen. So 
So just consider it. So does that make a difference then on how you, and what I choose for like the ventilator or life support? Yeah, so if you want to be an organ donor, um, but you don't want to be on life support indefinitely, then I would, you would choose um, to be on it for a period of time and then make sure your family knows just long enough for me to be an organ donor. Okay. What's, or, sorry, go ahead. No. Oh, so uh, age, mm -hmm. how old is too old? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I don't think there is an age that's too old. I hear people say all the time, no, there, nobody wants my organs, I'm too old, or I've got this disease or that disease. You don't have to know what they can take if there is something that, if that's something that you want to do. I have been learning only recently there are incredible things that they can do that I had no idea. Like they'll make um, screws out of bone for kid surgeries so yes. that it can, Yes. I mean, it's amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So there's a lot of things you might not even be aware of that they can do. Um, any questions about that? So again, you don't have to fill it out if you don't want to, but this is whether or not you would accept an autopsy under what circumstances. So you can choose, I do not want one at all, or I want one if it will help the advancement of medicine or medical education, or I would accept it if it can help my blood relatives understand the cause of my death, or assist them with their future healthcare decisions. So sometimes people will choose this one because they have a genetic disease and their family can learn about their own disease. Um, if through this autopsy, or if there's a, you know if it happens suddenly and your family needs to know what happened for their peace of mind, um, that might be another reason. So these are all things to consider. Um, burial and cremation. I know you were asking. Um, those are the two choices here. So most of the funeral, well, all the funeral planning happens with funeral homes, but you can make that basic preference known here. Um, and then if you have it prearranged with a funeral home, you can just fill in their information there and then they'll know who to call. Um, and if you intend to do that but don't have it done yet, you can always fill that in later. Because remember, this is not the legal part of the document, this is the guidance for your advocates. Okay. This down here, this health information exchange is free, it's optional, but we would need your permission to do it. So it's a network of hospitals throughout Michigan that shares these documents. So if, and not every hospital is on it, but if you are um, traveling in Traverse City, say, and something happens and their hospital need, you know, um, is on the network, they would be able to see your document because we have shared it, but we need your permission to do that. Um, so again, totally optional, but it's just a little extra coverage. Yeah. Okay. So this page, um, you can write your doc your main doctors down here if you want to, you don't have to. This is just for you to review every once in a while. To remember we talked about how you can update this document at any time. Um, so keep a list of the places that you've given it to so that if you do update it, you can get them a, a new copy if you've changed any of your preferences. But these are just some good places to think about keeping it. So definitely all of your advocates need a copy. Um, and I would say even give it to people who are not speaking for you if they would be heavily involved. Because again, remember, if they've heard your wishes ahead of time, even if they don't agree with it, they've heard you say it. So anybody who might be involved, if you have a pastor who might be very involved in this, it's a great idea to give them this copy, especially because they're probably coaching your family through some hard stuff. So them knowing your preferences is going to be really helpful to them. Uh, your doctor so you can take this completed document to your doctor's office and ask them to add it to your medical record um, or you can call me and I've got cards up here that you can take and I can I can do that for you um, but that way it's visible in all of the emergency rooms and also any doctor's office within Spectrum Health Lakeland um, and then they might stop asking you hopefully they're asking you everywhere you go if you have one of these um, your attorney, if that's important to you, in the glove box is a, a good one, um, and then in your pink folder on the fridge. And then these are just some good times to review it down below here. So every decade, we could change a lot in 10 years, so just look it over, make sure it still matches what you want. Um, anytime there's the death of a loved one, 
And that's going to be important to talk with your family about as well in this conversation. Um, what experiences have you had in the past with people that you've known and loved that have been injured or have passed? Um, share that with your family because it helps them understand where you're coming from. That kind of thing shapes what we might or might not want for ourselves. Um, so it can really, really help them understand your treatment decisions. Um, so anytime that you, someone in your life dies, it's a good time to look at it. It might have changed your mind <coughs> about what you want. Um, anytime there's a major life event, like a move or a divorce, uh, make sure your advocates are still are what, how you want them. Um, anything like that. So a new diagnosis, if you've been diagnosed with a serious health condition, is a good time to look at it. And then if you've got, had a significant decline, those are all just really good times to review it and make sure it still matches your goals. Okay, any questions? Oh, this is the do not resuscitate order. So this is the form that you'll need. It's in your folder. Only fill it out if you don't want to receive CPR. Both. They will also need this at the health system, and this also requires two witnesses. So if you have chosen not to receive CPR, get this witnessed at the same time to save yourself having to find another set of people. Go ahead. See, this is the one that I have a very, very, very big problem with. Okay. Uh, the wording of it. Do not resuscitate. I mean, the instinct of almost everyone in the world is to try and resuscitate. Mm -hmm. This has, this needs to be put, you know, I don't know if you, how many deaths you've seen, but I've seen a lot. And it's a very serious time, and they, they don't know, and yes, resuscitate. But the prolongation is the question, mm -hmm. not the resuscitate part. And that's because why everybody comes to resuscitate you. They come to help you. And then after that, into the court. Then what? And that's, that's what you described yeah. so adequately with your presentation. It was beautiful. It was oh, good. Beautiful. Good. But the resuscitate part, it's just so written in. If you were to fall down right now, mm -hmm. I would help you. Yeah. I would resuscitate you. Mm -hmm. I have nothing around you. Mm -hmm. But then, how long do you? But that's what this form is. These forms were about. Yeah. Yes. I right. Understand. Right. So that's step one. Res right. That's step one. And step then, one. and what happens through the decides yes. which which level yes. you want to be. But when they ask you the question, do you want to be resuscitated? My answer is yes. Yeah. I mean, I might be just in a, in a but, diabetic coma. I might just be where I need the AED. Well, then you would not fill out that form. Yeah. We don't fill that out. So then. It's just in there, in the kit, so that people have every piece they might need. You don't have to fill it out. So if you don't everyone want, wants to be resuscitated. That's not necessarily true. Not necessarily. No. No, no one ever wants to be resuscitated. I meet I people friend, all the time who don't want to. I have a friend who is 50 years old and she went through a horrible cancer. She has a do not resuscitate. And she well, loves children. She doesn't want to be resuscitated. And that's the immediate thing. Yes. Yeah, she just, no. So there has and to be a different thing. Like, yeah. Even on the little card that I filled out here, it's like, I want to be resuscitated. Okay. Yeah. My doctor only. I, I don't understand the question. After like that, that, I'm sorry. I just don't understand the question. I think it's a philosophy sort of thing. No, it's just you don't know what's going on. Every time. But it's all personal. So what you, it's personal for you, and it's not judgment on what somebody else wants if they want it or don't want it. This is about you and your wishes, not 
not your neighbors, not mine, not anybody else's. This, this is very personal for you. But do not resuscitate <laughs> is black and white. Yeah. So you for should you. only fill it out if you are black so and white about what you want. If the EMS comes in mm -hmm. and I have this hanging on the pink thing in my refrigerator, mm -hmm. it says do not resuscitate. They won't do anything. If it's filled out correctly, no, they won't. That's okay. right. They won't. But so that is the way a lot of things are worded now. Do not resuscitate. There's so many ways of resuscitating, but not prolonging life. Well, yeah, there are two separate questions. Difference. There, it, it, there is a difference. There's a right. big difference. Don't put me on a ventilator. Don't, don't do this. Ask my family later. That's in your past. In all of the wonderful things that you presented to us. Yeah. It, it, it makes so much sense what you presented to us. Okay. It's wonderful. Good. But. Yeah, Do so not resuscitate is the, the, the instinct of people to want to help. Yeah, you're right. That is people's instinct, and that yes. is what's going to happen if they're yes. not holding that yes. do not resuscitate order. The first thing they're going to do. Anita, we need to wrap this up a little bit. I'm sorry. We can chat afterwards. Yeah, we can chat afterwards. We're just going to go ahead and let her finish it up, and then we can continue it off the camera. Sorry. We can chat after. Yes, go ahead. Um, well, um, if you have a do not resuscitate, make sure it's notarized. Make sure it's notarized. Oh, it does not need to be notarized, actually. Well, uh, someone told me that it should not be notarized. I mean, you can if you want. Okay. I mean, it can't hurt, but it's not required. Yeah. Okay, any other questions about, oh, and you're, so these dates, again, half the match, your signature. You're gonna fill up this side if you're filling this out for yourself. This is only signature of legal representative. This side is only if, you know, like a, someone has lost the capacity and is filling it out for someone, a power of attorney or something like that. Um, so these dates have to match. This one, your doctor has to sign it. Uh, this date does not have to match because even the state knows that doctors are possible to get a list, okay? Um, and then again, there's that postcard for how to get a bracelet. Okay, so remember, we're going to make a bunch of copies when you get it done. Drop them from a chopper, I would say, <laughs> you know, when in doubt, just to make sure that your wishes are, co are covered. Um, and then we covered this. I haven't used this PowerPoint in a long time. I usually just talk, so. <laughs> well, that was nice having the PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Um, any other questions? I have a bunch of extra packets up here. If you have someone at home that you would like to take one home for, please, 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 if you know anyone who is experiencing memory loss and has not yet named their advocate, please ask them to do this immediately because what happens is if they don't name their healthcare power of attorney before they lose capacity to do so, then their family has to go through guardianship process with the court, which is an expense and months of red tape, and it's just unnecessary. So make sure that they're naming, at the very least, naming their advocate um, right away with a diagnosis of memory loss. Um, what, if, what if you then, yeah, then they wouldn't be your advocate. I mean, they have to accept it. I'll ask, I'll ask them. Well, and here's, so here's another thing. So this is a community service that we offer for free throughout the community because it helps us take better care of people if we know what they want. Otherwise, we have to give them everything because if we don't know. Um, so we have trained facilitators. We've got about 100 of them throughout the community who can walk your family or your loved ones, whoever, through this conversation. We've gotten really creative with it during COVID. We can either come to a home if, if people are comfortable with that and if they have a hard time getting out or we can do it by conference call or a Zoom call. Um, so that is a free service that's available to you. Um, there's cards up here 
Um, oh, actually, there's cards in your packet for how to call and make an appointment if you want to do that. Um, extras, and then there's some extra of the question sheets if you want to walk through that. I would say too, if you're going to do this with your family, rip off the band-aid and get everybody's done who's over 18. If one of you is going to talk about it, you at least all need to know what each other wants. So you might as well get it all done at the same time. And remember, you can change it at any time. And we can help with that too, sit through a family conversation um, and talk that through. Sometimes if you, think, if you anticipate it being difficult or people being resistant, we're happy to help with that. People are usually on much better behavior if there's a stranger in the room. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for taking the extra time. I see we went a little over. You guys have had great questions. Thank you. That was awesome. I, yeah, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Thank you for the questions. We appreciate that. Thank you for being here. And if you have any other questions, please get in touch with Julie or the, the process of what to do. For the people watching the video, thank you so much for watching. If you want any of the forms, contact me. I'm Diana, the program coordinator here at the Basque, and we'll get you hooked up with the right person and get you the forms or however we need to do that. So please reach out to me. Anything else? I'm gonna, Julie, thank you. Oh, I think my personal way, I just really thought it was just wonderful. So good. Thank, thank you so, so much. much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. You had great questions. Have a good rest of your day. And my card's up here too if you ever want to reach me.